Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Tommy Reyes. I'm the curator and owner of Gallery 19, and we are partnering with Pilsen Arts and Community House to present a solo exhibition by Andrew Sedgwick Guth uh, that is opening on August 6th and will be running for two months. And we are super excited to be talking with Andrew about his series and about the work and about his process. So Andrew, thank you so much for joining us on Zoom so that everyone can uh, hear about your work before the exhibition. So we will also run this uh, artist talk during the, during the opening, but we'll also have it available on our YouTube channel so people can look at it beforehand so that they can ask you all kinds of questions at the opening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so thanks Andrew, for having me, yeah. <laughs> so Andrew, so let's talk a little bit about, so we've been talking about this exhibition Oh, well, about a year now, because I reached out to you uh, and I want us to, I want you to first talk about um, what sparked the idea for this body of work. Well, um, I guess you would say initially it wouldn't be that deep of an impulse. It was more about, I think it was more of an organic reaction to, you know, the initial COVID is here and we're going to have to go into isolation for two weeks and then it'll be over. You know how we were all fed that. And then obviously that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many of us were not prepared. I think almost everyone was not prepared for this. Um, and so just being in my studio, my studio fortunately is in my house. Um, I, at the time had a, a a, an additional studio, a public studio, which I had, I just only grabbed it. I don't really work. I didn't really work in that one, but I grabbed some of my belongings from that. Again, not anticipating it was going to be more than two weeks. And so we're a month or so into the pandemic. I'm in my studio and I'm running out of supplies. And as you have seen and other people have seen, uh, most of my work are predominantly works on paper. And I use a specific type of paper and I was at the very end of what I had. So um, I usually work fairly large mm -hmm. and how it started was I just ripped sizes of the remaining paper and like, okay, so I have six pieces here. What am I going to do? And things going through my brain were maybe a little bit more dire or dramatic, but not necessarily dramatic, I don't think, because mm -hmm. people um, were really going through it. Mm -hmm. And we were unsure what the future would bring. And I, um, I don't think it's selfish to say that many of us, including myself, was thinking about like, what does this mean for me as a human? Right. And I thought about relationships and, oh my, you know, oh my God, am I, am I never even going to be in love again? Am I never going to have, like, have intimacy again and, and things of that nature? Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, usually my work is, hasn't been very overtly aggressive sexually. Mm -hmm. And I think in some way it gave me a little leeway and freedom to just like, okay, well, um, screw all this. I don't really care what anyone thinks. I don't care if anyone's going to be offended. Not that my audience would be offended, but mm -hmm. so I just started um, randomly. I picked, I think initially there were a few images from some vintage porn that I had. And I just used some of those photos as reference and created you know, the drawings of what then became the painting. So it's like, it was more about like physical intimacy. And also uh, it, it was just like natural. I even started using myself as a model and just like, what was I wearing most of the time in the beginning was sweatpants and my white socks. And I happen to wear briefs a lot. So it's like, so that's kind of where the socks and the briefs thing came into place. And, and also leading up to this, my work had transitioned in regards to the addition of media, specifically the embroidery, the, the embroidery floss, the yarn, um, going back to some of my earlier works where it was like very mixed media heavy with like ephemeral things. Um, so 
initially these, these paintings were just going to be like simple, flat. I mean, they have a flatness to them, mm -hmm. but I really do admire some artists who are very minimal and simplistic and they have like these very strong forms and, and, and yeah, Yes, they're very involved in regards to their talent and what's going on in their brain. But visually, you look at something, I'm just like, well, this is very sexy and clean and cleaning is in line and, mm -hmm. and, and shape and color. And, and I, have, I was trying to challenge myself to like de-simplify mm -hmm. my aesthetic. And I don't know that I was necessarily successful in that. I, 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 what I've learned also as well, this is not necessarily answering the question, what I've learned about myself is that this is just who I am. Right. So I think many people across the board and even artists will look at other others in their peer group and do a lot of comparing type of thing. And it's okay not to be that other person or maybe to fit in to what maybe a bunch of other people happen to be doing or their aesthetic. So it empowered me in some regard to just truly embrace like, this is what I do. It doesn't look like anybody else. This is me. And that's okay. Um, I don't have to worry about if I'm a cool kid or what have you. Um, but so this started in that way. I, I started. And then, of course, I was sharing them in stories and stuff like on Instagram. I think even my story sharing went up exponentially, which I think many people did as well, because many of us were alone or, you know, and that was a, an, an outlet to humanity in a way. So, um, so I did share, I was sharing this regularly and not that the response was important in regards to me continuing to do the work, but it was very supportive. It was very like, people loved seeing it, at least those who reached out to me um, to express that. Um, so I just took it as an opportunity to do some more exploration. Um, I had other ideas in my brain. I had like, it's like a cache of, of, of projects that are always stored here. And when I had made my triptych piece, that was a big transition for me. But I had about maybe 30 or 40 unfinished works that I had stopped at the time to, to do this triptych because of life events. And I needed, like, I have a habit, but I don't like to leave things unfinished. Uh, if they, if I don't want to continue with them, I destroy them. Mm -hmm. And, but I wanted to finish these pieces. So I went back into them, had some embroidery um, to sort of tie things together. And, and it made sense at the time. And I think it, it enhanced the pieces, obviously, or I wouldn't have done it. And then I had other concepts, again, in my brain that I was going to move forward with. And then the pandemic happened and this completely shifted my direction in terms of what I was trying to say and the focus of what I was, what I was like trying to address for myself. Usually I like multi-figured pieces, like more than two. Right. Um, and these, many of these were became like just singles or couples. And I think the singles particularly reference my sense of isolation mm -hmm. during that time. And there, there's a romanticism to them. I think there's a softness and intimacy to many of them, even though there might be a sexual charge to them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm rambling. So, <laughs> well, but no, see, so you actually said a, a, a lot of really great ideas and when it comes to like as I'm moving forward like this really ties into what you had done with your artist statement and how you talked about how social media has played an important role in this series and um, can you talk a little bit about where the imagery is coming from I know that some of it is coming is our self portraits of you but there are mm -hmm. others that are not and where is that imagery coming from and how do you select that uh, is it mainly like community based where people are coming out and reaching out to you on in the social media world or um, how is it working for you? How are you choosing? Okay, so yes, it's true. I, I, I do have a few pieces that are based on myself, like, you know, self portrait. I think that's fairly common right. with artists, especially people who like creatives who work with figure that's common. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm right here, so it's easy. 
like to have to, to, to you know to have me as a reference and I could put, take photos of my because I work strictly from photos mm-hmm. I'm not a real live person I can like you know figure models and what have you like I prefer to take a photo so I could just have it there and I don't want anyone else's energy around me at the time when I'm when I'm doing what I'm doing. So, but to answer you, the, the connection with, with social media, uh, I had referenced before that that some of these images were from vintage porn that I've sort of updated. Um, some of them I might have like put clothes on or taken clothes, like you know I've up you know like I said I've already said updated, but you know. I've taken them as a reference and I've morphed them into what I needed them to be at the time. Um, this was specifically for pieces that included two figure, like that type of mm-hmm. arrangement because I didn't have access to setting that sort of um, session up with anybody. I, I, I could have done, um, via DMs or text messaging or email if someone happened to be in lockdown with a significant other, a partner, what have you. Um, but that's something I tread lightly with. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's not something that I will voluntarily like say, hey. Um, but in regards to the other figures, many of these paintings are based on people who exist right now, real life humans, that um, many of them at the, at the point of creating these pieces, I had never met before outside of social media. Um, so my relationship with them is strictly based on my screen, their screen sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and really choices that I would make in regards to individuals is this organic, and impulsive. It's literally like just laying in bed, scrolling through my feed at night. And then just someone would like pop out. Sometimes it would be someone who wouldn't even post that often. Mm -hmm. And you sort of like forgot about them. And then there they were. Um, I will say as well, these are based on a lot of people's either selfies or they set their, their, their phone up or their camera up with a timer type of thing to create their their post and they might naturally just have had a composition that I found appealing mm-hmm. in a number of ways. So, I mean, it could just be the aesthetics of it. It's the arrangement of the body. Um, I like to have open space between limbs, like the positive negative space. Um, and going further from that, like, so I would then reach out to that person and be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Would you be comfortable with me using this image of you to make a painting of you? Mm -hmm. Um, So on and so on. Because for me, consent is very important. And I like to have some sort of a dialogue with someone at first because some people aren't comfortable. Some people aren't comfortable being tagged and stuff just because of... um, their professions or their, their family life, because sometimes, you know, we have these on Instagram in particular, a close friends list. So sometimes people would story images of themselves and just like, you know, more provocative, you, you know, um, more of the, the, you know, the thirst traps. And so instead of like just screenshotting it, I would reach, I would respond to that message and be like, Hey, can I use this image? And then sometimes people are completely fine. Sometimes, um, I've never had anything negative. It just would be like, I'd rather you didn't tag me because of X, Y, and Z. Or then others would be, oh, because it's going to be a painting, it's a piece of art, I have zero issue mm-hmm. being tagged or referenced. Um, because some of these paintings, um, as I post them on Instagram, are not tagged for an express reason. Um, they might have the person's name in it, but their first name is sort of anonymous anyway. Um, um, But, but, and then there's even a few that are like, not, you know, okay with even having their name used. So, but some of these, some of the, uh, the, the 
subjects for the pieces I have known personally, like, 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 um, I've had relationships with them in the past, um, a varying level, um, or they're, they're friends now. Um, but I would say probably the bulk of these portraits are based on those that I have not physically met yet. Now I, I, I have since things have lightened up and I've traveled some more, I've had the opportunity to meet in person some of the subjects of the paintings, which has been really fulfilling and, and great. Um, but I think that answers your question. I'm not sure, <laughs> like that's- No, it does. But you know, that's really interesting because you know, like as we, you know, you started the project during the pandemic, right? In, yes. In, in, a, in a way that was looking because you were by yourself, right? right. You were isolated. And now in order to create, that was really interesting because you were then creating connections through social media of people that you were painting. So you, you'd begin to create connections with the work. And then as you've moved in, as the series has can progress, you just finished a residency, right? Where you were working on, with models. And how is that, I mean, how is that experience, is that experience changed the way um, because you're directing them, I'm assuming, right? So yes. like, yeah. I, I want this composition. Right. So how, how did that change from when you were DMing people and saying, hey, you know, or someone sent you an image, right? And said, hey, if you're interested, here's an image of me, right? right. They'd set up their own selfie. Um, and then you would decide whether or not it, the, you were attracted to the composition of it. So how did that, how does that feel like as it's moved in, as you continue to move in as the, you know, the world tries to open up, right? Uh, and we begin to try and reconnect with the world around us. How does that, how has that changed for you now as you've moved into these later pieces where you, where you've used models that well, you really stood in front of? I would say like, so in the, in the beginnings of things, because I couldn't have physical contact with people, meaning I couldn't be, we couldn't be in the same space right. to even have a photo session um, to create reference material from, th there was sort of a, um, a nice perk to that because I could give some, because some, with some of these people then they, they might've posted something, right? And it might not even be, it might not have even been what I would have liked from them, but they, as like their energy and as a person, as an individual, I was like, I would love to paint this person. So then I would have a dialogue and it would be like, and I would give them examples of how to pose themselves. And then they would send me some photos back, what have you. And I was able to edit and I was also able to be like, oh, I'm, you know, can, can you not be backlit and, um, so I learned very quickly via that, that, that way, like mm -hmm. how to communicate with the person to, to tell them more precisely what I would need from them. Mm -hmm. um, also just telling them like, if, if you see my work, I'm more concerned about contour line. Like right. you don't have to look pretty in these. Like, but I need to see the line. I can't have, again, like light coming from the front and it's blurring out like your chin line with your, your neckline and, and what have you. And then sometimes um, we all have our angles, which we think that we look more attractive from. Um, it's so strange how technology has influenced how we perceive ourselves and how we look at other people. Um, I have, I tend to think that I know how people would look better if they would just listen to me, um, <laughs> because of, you know, sometimes when people place cameras up on the floor or they'll have a tripod or what have you. And I have, so then I had to tell them for my purposes that it needed to be level and needed to be straight on, um, because a distortion starts to happen. If you're familiar with just like rendering a figure, you know, someone might sit a certain way like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, like it's, it's that, that's not what I'm into. So, right. so the, the difference then working during my residency with live models, that was also very educational and informative to me because I enjoyed the process and I understand how I can have more immediate control of what I'm looking for, but 
the challenges are it's another human being in front of you. There's a, a there's an allotted time period. Um, I like a person to be comfortable. So it's like, you know, they're coming into a, a space and it's like wham, bam kind of a thing. And right. I like to like, first off, I mean, just simple things like, you know, I have them sign a waiver and we have a conversation about consent and their comfort level. Mm-hmm. And I talk to them about, even though I, ha- I have already f- physically written out in advance what to expect from the experience, if anything on their end had changed in terms of their comfort level, that's totally fine. And right. just even touching a person, right. you know, for me it's important to be like asking for consent in advance and then telling them in advance, like, hey, can I adjust your, your arm here to go here because there's not enough negative space? Because I did learn that it was easier to touch someone. It was like, it's it, not to say that, because I had to be economical with time. Right. It, it, it worked to both our benefit. If I, could, if I could move what I needed to move for them versus trying to tell them in words. And then, you know, we're spending two minutes trying to figure out like, no, no, like here, here, here kind of thing. Um, and I'm not a professional portrait photographer. So I am like simply just looking for what I need from them. Right. Uh, what I also learned was going into it, you know, I had a set grouping of like what sort of poses and images I would want from these people. And I, I learned, cause I did this over a course of days. So as it progressed over the days then I had learned like, Um, I liked having them move around more and just like having just like take just clicking, clicking, clicking um, because there's things I want to work on in the future that involve like taking clothes off or putting them on. It it depends on what the viewer is, but like to have someone pose like putting on a pair of shorts or a pair of socks, it can look so stiff and that's fine with what I'm doing, but it's really great to have someone actually just going through the motion and you're just like randomly grabbing. And again, there's like this organic, like, like magical piece to that. And then you can go through and be like, Oh, this looks fantastic. And I might have to do some minor adjustments myself and, and pulling their arm out when I'm drawing or what have you. But anyway, and uh, I'd say the last thing is just, again, having another person, in the room with me in that energy um, because we feed off of one another, like people will like present a certain way um, when they're in your space. Um, And even those folks who had experienced modeling before, Mm -hmm. again, they're human, it requires a little you know, um, not nurturing, but just giving them some space to kind of like unwind and like just kind of get into the moment. I find that people get very stiff right. and I would, I would constantly tell people to like, just shake, just shake yourself out, you know, and just like, and adjust your weight where you would naturally, you know, when you're hanging out, talking to friends, which I found interesting with some people who have never modeled before. It took them a minute to realize how they actually carry themselves and they and they where they actually pivot their weight to on their hips and what have you but um i do want to do more of that in the future i I want to work with live models and it had not been something i was really planning on um it was very comfortable with what i was already doing um but there's I, i really did enjoy that aspect especially when you're when you're with somebody and when you're when you're talking to someone it really does help to influence maybe even on a subconscious level like possibly even what colors you're choosing to use for them so and it also going forward when I'm working with people now I it's I am going to start having more of a kind of like a question and answer thing to kind of get a just very simple things, like even simple things like, what is your favorite color? Or, you know, what's what's a favorite memory of yours from summer or something that helps to tell me a little bit more about them? Because I do use text 
often in my work, maybe not as much in the, these works, but I do use text and I can pull things from their own memory or their own experiences and incorporate them into my work. So but it's about creating that connection that yeah. you're interested in. Um, so I think that that's really interesting. The, the, so as we're moving, so what I would like to now talk about, because I think that a lot of people may have questions about is your actual making process. So you, I'm, so I know that uh, on social media, you show um, a lot of your using that like darker pencil um, that you use, uh, but beforehand, do you sketch it out? And then do you plan it out? I mean, yeah. like, you look at like, okay, this is going to be this. So how, how do you decide to do that? Well, really it's just based on the image. Because mm -hmm. once I have like a, a, a photo, usually what I do is I print out whatever the photo is mm -hmm. and I tape it to the wall. And even though, so this paper is that Arches um, oil-based paper, it's 140 pounds. It's a thick paper and it's a big, big roll. Um, from France, that's the only place, like, I've only been able to find it from a few places. Like that was another piece. Like I was finally then able to get a brand new roll of paper a little bit further into um, the quarantine period, which was a gift in some ways. I was finally able to order art supplies because it was running. So then I was able to do more of these pieces, but to answer, so even, so this paper is already primed but I, you know, I, I fold my paper, I score it, I, I, I rip it because I like a deckled edge. And because these are like floating, I just think a deckled egg, edge is like very, is very sexy. And um, I think it just gives something to the viewer. Um, it, it gives a better sense like, oh, this is paper, you know, versus canvas. So I measure, score, tear, tape to my wall, and then I prime it once more mm -hmm. um, because the white of the, what they use to prime it is very white. Mm -hmm. And I like more of a little bit of a, a duller white with this. Like, so it's not like a, the bright white. So it's in comparison, it almost looks like a very light gray compared to the white, but see the, because I tape off the paper with the painter's tape, the edges, because I always leave that border, that is the true color of the paper. That, that's not my um, priming it additionally. That's the, that's the white, white of the paper. So I have that taped to the wall. I have the reference image taped to the wall. And then I usually use like a, like a 4H pencil, an HB pencil, like a typical drawing pencil. And I pretty much, draw it out like um and because I feel like that that point it's it's easier for me to erase marks but I actually try not to erase marks that often because I like seeing a little of that active um history of it um underneath like if you look closely at some of these pieces you'll see in very small places where you can see where there's like, you can see that original pencil line mm -hmm. because there's been an adjustment with like the hands or something with the face. Um, but then I go over it with a, just a standard, uh, a black colored pencil. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did try initially using like heavier weighted uh, traditional drawing pencils, like six, 6B, 8B, but they smudge a lot right. and I have a habit of like my hands dragging, like uh, because I technically um, hold my pencils incorrectly as many of my art teachers had told me over my formative career. Um, um, but it, it's just how I draw. And so I use the black pencil and then that is like the final mark um, of, of the outline. And I go fairly fast because I want to have like a really strong contour. I don't want, I mean, I'm not whipping it, but I'm like, I'm, I'm going a, a good steady pace. And sometimes because I'm like on my wall and it's an old plaster wall, sometimes it'll slide a little bit or what, like, so there's this, so yes, I'm redrawing and kind of tracing the original drawing, 
but it becomes its own drawing as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, and then we go from there and then it's really about the background color that I decide on and then it's mixing skin tones. So, um, so I, a lot of the work you have that, so you have the black line that you do with the colored pencil, but then to top it off, you leave a little bit of white space around. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Which which creates it, which gives it a, which gives it a very design graphic look, but not really because it's all because it's not mechanical. So why do you decide to do that? I don't even know that I have a clear answer for that. I don't, I don't know that that was, I, I, I think. I mean, it's such a big part of your work. Of I know, but I, I think it was instinctual. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that comes from. I became aware of it. Um, you know, a lot of it, I think, if I would have that black line and then I would have the color, like the, the, the background color, like say the yellow, and it comes right against that black line. And then I have a skin tone, which is like a caramel color. And it's like, boom, boom. I, I feel then from a viewer's point of view, if you step back from it, if you're not up close to it, if you step back from it, what then creates the contour line visually for people would be the meeting of that yellow and that caramel. Right. And that's not what I want. So I want there to be a distinction. I want, because, I oftentimes really love my drawings more than the end result of the painting. Mm -hmm. and it, there's like, I have a real soft spot for them. And sometimes I wish I could just leave them like that. So I love drawing um, certain types of drawing. Um, so that's just for me too. Yeah. So I, I wanna be like, no, I did work there. So, and you need to see it. <laughs> right. So it's kind of, it, it reminds me a lot of, so when I look at your work originally before I even talk to, talk to, to you, I saw your work on social media, I saw the one, and at first I was like, oh, it looks like a blind contour drawing. I mean, it, that was the first thing that I thought about, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting, and I want to know more. So that's what delved me into it, was the technique, which is why I thought, oh, is that, so that's why I was asking why the white line why the white space between the line because i just wanted to because i think that it really accentuates the contour which is what exactly you want it to do so now as you're so as we so now you're in the piece right and you it's very flat and, and then what made you decide the applications the embroidery how what was that thought process or did you just know you wanted to do it and you started from the beginning Initially, when I when I painted these, I had no intention of utilizing the embroidery, although I had utilized it in, I'll reference like my triptych that I've done, like, which is similar to these, like similar to these, but on a larger scale. To be frank, I didn't anticipate that these pieces would go beyond mm -hmm. um, me initially just doing them. I felt at the time I needed to be doing stuff. I needed to be working in order to to preserve my mental health. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm busy, then I have less room to be sad and get worried. And, you know, being separated from people I love and being concerned for people I love and just having had some major losses the year before, it was just very, like this This was the way of getting me through. So, but to answer, then I, then I, started some of these pieces and then I realized how much I actually like them mm -hmm. and but I was like but they need more they just can't be this thing so that's how the embroidery started and and I knew like the body here is one thing it's not one thing because it's very involved and some of them are only body hair because well body hair because there's so much work in it but some others based on like, maybe they're a person that doesn't have a lot of body hair naturally. So then how do I, so all the, then all the drama, all the like, the interest, then I don't have that opportunity, like to kind of, to make the piece less visually flat. So that's how a lot of these, the exterior embellishments started to occur. It was more about a balance of like, okay, and then, you know, clearly it became just a natural, like, okay, 
the background and the subject seem to be two different worlds. How do I marry them together? So, um, and that's where the acetate really started happening a lot, so. Yeah, and it's, I, I just think that it adds, I remember when I saw it for the first time, when you'd sent me those images and I started looking at it, I was like, I, I just love the fact that it has this, so there, the painting itself is very flat and graphic, right? Which is really gorgeous. But then you add this additional layer of your hand even more into it by embroidering and manipulating the paper and adding the acetate, which I think really just creates really beautiful moments in some of the pieces. Like Thank you. The, the, the socks in the sock piece <laughs> that, that you have where it's the, where it's the self portrait of you pulling up the jog strap, but the socks in there are really a beautiful moment in this fairly simple piece, right? But it, when you look at it, it's just, just really gorgeous. And I wanna know more and I wanna see more. Thanks. Um, so, so yeah, so I think it works really well like that. So now like, we're, as we're talking about it, so then you, you decided to create frames. So you're working with a framer that, that you're helping out work on the frames yes. and, and you're doing them in a shadow box style. So, you know, so let's talk about that. What, what was the decision making behind that? Did you know that you wanted to do that? Have you done that? Well, I, I, well because I do works on paper mm -hmm. um, and, excuse me, now my, my earlier career, I, I almost, I was always working on canvas. Mm -hmm. Oil paints, canvas. Um, you can still, if someone knows me and looks at it, they could, they'd be like, oh, that is you. Um, but it's markedly different than this right now. Um, I, the working on paper developed because sometimes I would just do these mixed media one-offs with like beeswax and pages from old books and like they were more abstractions and it gave my head space to just be free and maybe have more fun. Um, the same thing with the block prints, they were like, cause usually my paintings for me had a lot of the emotional weight Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm not necessarily aware of that. And then I realize, like, oh, why am I feeling this way? I'm just like, you need to just step away for a few days. But um, but to answer about the, the shadow box frame, because I start working on paper, I like working on many things at once. I'm not a start to finish person. I've never been. I've always had to have a series of works going on. And I found that if I had works taped to the wall, I could get more on my wall. I, I had more, more options right. to bounce around to. So that's, that's how the paper thing sort of started. And then, but the, with the frames, because of these people pieces being on paper, mm -hmm. again, I want to emphasize to people that they are works on paper and not everyone is familiar in my language or in the world of people like me that are familiar like just like I'm not a plumber I'm right. not gonna understand all their tools and everything that they use that are necessary um so how can I kind of not hit you over the head but just kind of be like hey this is not canvas this is paper right uh, and I like shadow box frames for that reason because even smaller pieces mounting them from the top it allows the sides and the bottom to kind of hang naturally and you get it like because there is that 3D element. And I wanted shadow box in particular for these pieces because a number of them, even with the acetate, I went off the frame within the frame, you know, the, the white edges, I've, I've gone off the edges because I really enjoy the moments of like, so I, if I have like a pink piece of acetate on a yellow background, it becomes more of a fuchsia, it becomes darker, but then it, bleeds off onto the white edge and then it becomes that bright pink again. And I like that play. And if I didn't have it in shadow box frame and it was like just smashed in a regular frame, you wouldn't get a sense of, of that. You wouldn't get a sense of like the 3D nature of the yarn versus the embroidery floss. It wouldn't breathe the same way. I, I know that might sound cliche, but it's like, but that's, that's the point of it. And I wanted them to be kind of not like a jewel box, but there's the embellishments are, are 
are like magical little jeweled pieces to me in some way. So like there's a preciousness to them, which is reflective of the preciousness of the individual as well. Um, because every like all these subjects to me, like they have their own inherent beauty. And I have always been drawn to beautiful things. And like that's, you know, that beauty can mean many different things. Um, so it's just a way to, pre to present it and preserve it in a way that I find is honoring both the work that I've done and the subject. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, it's, and the other thing is, is that a lot of people don't realize as we had talked earlier before we started this talk is that the pieces are fairly large. I mean, they're not huge, not but, huge, but, but they are larger works. Most people think when, oh, when you see it on social media, you think that it's really small. Um, but no, they're really, they're how, because how big is the paper about, again? About like three, usually about like three feet tall by two feet wide. They usually average about 26 inches by 33 or 34 inches. Mm -hmm. And then when you frame um, them, you have space around them, which makes them even right. a slightly larger. But I, I, but they're able to live I, and breathe in this space, you know, as from the photos that I've seen, I'm so excited to actually see them in person is that, you know, they will be the I, I just think that they're gonna look amazing the way the the way the show is gonna be hung. Thank you. Yeah. So and I, I I have had them before um I had you know previewed a few of them in Richmond, Virginia. Um, just so like some people could see a few of them in person and at the time didn't have frames and so they were just mounted free floating to the wall. I like I use um um, those little round magnets, like I would have nails in the wall and then I would just have the magnets on top of the piece because it doesn't harm anything. Right. But, you know, we had to have a little science printed, like do not touch. Um, I had to tell people do not touch them because, and, and, and this is even addressing those who are in my world regularly, like other creatives. And they were like, but I just have this strong, impulse I want I want to like rub my hands along and I want to there's because it's so tactile looking right. it's like it's seductive in a way of like it's like telling you to touch me but I'm just like I don't I wouldn't I would normally have been like okay but there's a lot of like white in here and, and people I don't think are aware like just yeah you might have just washed your hands but you, like we create body oils and like all these like there's things will happen yes so, it's better that these are these are kept in a frame. Um, well, I mean, I know because when you're so, as you know, we're doing a print, right? So there's a print, and together we had the conversation of which one is going to be the print. When it arrived, you know, the piece arrived at the gallery. Of course, I opened it up, and yes, I do. I did have that. Well, yeah, you could have reaction of oh, <laughs> I'd love to touch this, but I was like absolutely not you know so i had to put you know in order to but i do see that i would see that that because i actually had that reaction too i was like wow because uh the one that we're sh printing is the one with the jogging pants and the jogging yes. pants are all embroidered which yes. which you don't really get to see on social media but then when you see it in person it's like wow that's a lot of work uh, yeah. And that was my that was my initial reaction. I was like, "Oh, I really would love to touch that," but I was like, "I am not touching that." <laughs> <laughs> no, and then I'm like, I feel like there's even something even there's something to be said about that, even subconsciously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I you know I could tie it into again to like the pandemic and isolation and like so we have these screens and we're looking at all these things that we want to touch but we can't touch them. Right. We can't access them. So. And I do agree. I think that your work has a really beautiful tactile nature to it. That one seen in person, it just keeps drawing you in, which I think is the whole point of the series is you're trying to make connections, you know, so I think that that kind of works out with that. The other thing that I was hoping that we talk about, which is very overtly about your work is masculinity and your thoughts on that, because, um, you know, this idea of the you know, male image, you know, I wonder, do you think about that as you're working or is it, or just automatically built in to the imagery? 
I think it might automatically be built into the imagery. I know we've all been like over the years have been having a lot of conversations about masculinity. Um, I identify as a gay man, I'm a queer artist. I've been met with preconceived notions of what masculinity is supposed to be in a heteronormative dominant culture and world. Um, so, you know, I know that we all can regale each other with many stories of our own experiences and our own evolution within the confines of what that is. Right. And then even with the, within our own queer community, the, the learning and progression that we've had to do along the way with that as well. So um, I do understand that most of my figures at this point in my career are male presenting. Um, that, that was very much a conscious decision um, because I mean, someone can argue with me, obviously, I would rather not, but people can have their points. But I found like through my formal education in, in the arts, um, it was often you would see female nudes presented, female figures in intimate settings and in vulnerable settings presented with, it was just normal, quote unquote, whatever normal is, it was acceptable. Although predominantly those images were created by men, a number of like straight men. So it's through the male gaze, et cetera. But I started to find that when I became a young adult, just becoming more interested in other artists, specifically queer artists and how their works, even though they were famous and established are still censored, even going to a public museum or space, how often do I see works that I would even relate to as like a gay man, as a queer person? And it's not many unless I am projecting myself into an already like heteronormative narrative, right. um, which we are all doing. So this was like very pointed for me the past few years to just create works and where like other gay men, other like queer male identifying people can see themselves more regularly. And I do understand with the power of social media and that we've had more exposure to that, but on the flip of the same coin, we are still being censored and isolated. We are still not able to express ourselves 100% without fear. Um, so it's a, pretty much an extension of the real world. So. I was recently in a, a museum. Uh, 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 so I was involved in a group exhibit in a, in, in a museum mm -hmm. and the pandemic happened, which is still happening obviously, but you know, lockdown happened and this piece was installed already. The opening didn't happen. They turned it into a, a, a virtual exhibit. Fine. Um, this piece did not have anything overtly sexual. There was like, one, there were, there were two pairs of male figures who were embracing and one of the figures within the couple happened to be fully nude, but you only saw the buttocks. The reason I bring this up is this was accepted into this space, an established museum. Mm -hmm. They, and it was beautifully installed and it was then offhandly shared to me that it was specifically placed where it was placed so that if they had school groups come through, mm -hmm. they could divert the school group from seeing my piece. Mm -hmm. So some people might wanna say, we don't need this anymore, blah, blah, blah. Queer artists don't only have to like paint, you know, figures or, or sexualize things like, but our sexuality, like, the heteronormative world defines us via our sexuality. Right. You know, so I realize again, I'm all like all over the place. I wasn't really, I haven't thought this, this out too well, but uh, that's okay. Um, this is, this is, this is the why, this is the why. I'm not saying like this will always be what I will do, but right now this is what I'm doing. And in regards to masculinity, whatever, that definition, 
definition is to the person who, who I am portraying, like, and I don't necessarily clearly know what that is, but it's what they project. To right. Me. So I don't know, some people would look at jewelry or um, there's even like some visual cues, like, okay, so what kind of underwear are they wearing? Like there's sort of a strange, not like strange, but there's a uniform of sorts right. that we all, like a coded thing that we speak to each other with. Mm -hmm. and, and even the way that a figure will present themselves, mm -hmm. like to have, you know, uh, this male identifying person like sitting in such a way that they're like, their buttocks are like pushed out and they're like kind of presenting themselves like to be like, this is what I want you to look at. So would a heterosexual male do that? I don't know. So like, but again, I don't want to like label anyone or, or, or put any sort of parameters or anything. But I mean, I've certainly had my own um, issues with whatever quote unquote masculinity is and I'm still doing my own work on myself um, because of that and probably always will be, so. Yeah, I, think that the, I think that the definition of masculinity is constantly fluid and it is what it is at the moment. And I think it is a personal thing for all, for all men who are trying to figure out what that is and what it means to them. But I was just wondering because um, I feel like your work in some way uh, talks a little bit about masculinity as an underlining theme. Um, but also, it's it, what I find interesting is that um, the imagery somehow sometimes feels heroic, even even the ones that are a little bit more sexual. But they're her even the the figures in there have a sense of uh, of, of heroicness to it that it well, draws me to it. Um, so that's why I was really wondering if you had planned that. Well, uh, it's curious that you 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 saw that because. I don't have an obsession with astrology, like the zodiac, not the zodiac, constellations. And the zodiac and constellations are tied together and Greek mythology, what have you. And mm -hmm. many of my pieces reference mythology, but, but that, my interest in that really was born of learning about the constellations growing up, mm -hmm. like looking at the sky. And I think it was also part of like, even though I had like, like I loved my family and I loved the house I grew up in and what have you, there was always this, this part of me that knew I was different and I wanted to be somewhere else. And it was like, even looking at the sky, but the heroic aspect is like, so you have someone like Orion, which I've referenced numerous times, you know, like warrior or what have, not necessarily a great guy, but like there, you know, how many of them are actually, but, uh, <laughs> but there is that piece to like, there's, I don't want to say deification of some of these pieces, but it's like, um, I don't want to say like iconography either. Like there's like this, they are sort of godlike in their own way. Um, so I don't disagree with you on that. I, I'm just kind of pleasantly surprised that you saw that. Well, yeah, I mean, you remember I have an art history background, so I have, I start. <laughs> right, right, right. So I start pulling everything as I as I begin to look at work. I mean, it's and you look for that spark. You know, each artist that I choose, I'm looking for their spark. Uh, you know, and as I saw your work, that's what I saw. So it was really interesting. But Andrew, thank you so much for taking the time to talk sure. with us about sure. your work. Just to remind everybody, you will actually be at the opening. It'll be August 6th and it's from six to nine at Pilsen Arts and Community House and Gallery 19. So you'll be able to see it. Uh, people will be able to come and meet you. Um, but then beforehand, we'll also be doing a private event and people can follow us, uh, Gallery 19 on social media to see if they would like to be a part of that event. So thank you again, Andrew, uh, once again. And I am so looking forward to seeing your work and talking to you more about it. <laughs> well, thank you.